uh, next to your name on, on the film when uh, the first time the credit comes up. Okay. And then the other thing I have you do is um, just uh, we also got a verbal release and just say yes, you know you're being filmed for Color Me Obsessed and you're fine with the footage being used in the film. Okay. So which part would you like me to do first? Either, that makes no difference. Okay. <laughs> my name is Bill McLeslie and my title. Uh, I've gone with the professional title of TGWGTD, which means the guy who gets things done, and that's been my title for 15 years. Um, so, but don't use, just use the initials, and people will be confused by that. <laughs> um, I, I realize that I'm being uh, photographed, recorded, and videotaped for the film Color Me Obsessed. Excellent. And you're cool with that? I'm very cool with that. Okay. Yes, very cool with that. Okay. Um, Why the replacements? Why the replacements? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I'll give you the backstory. Um, I lived about three blocks from a local record store in Minneapolis called Orfolk Jokopus. And I, <clears throat> during high school, uh, would visit there regularly, maybe seven, nine times a week <laughs> to see okay. what was coming in on the used pile. Uh, and I uh, met a gentleman named Peter Jesperson, who was manager of the store and uh, was a big influence on what I would select. You know, if I pulled up a bunch of albums and he was titled, totaling them up and I could see the grimace on his face, he, I might, oh, I was just thinking about that when I'd pull it back out of the pile. Um, anyway, so Peter and I became known to each other over the period of time that I was going to the record store a few years. And I, uh, I got a call one night from uh, a music club in town called Duffy's. And Duffy's, some, I, honestly, I don't remember who the person was, asked me if I could come down and do sound for a band that was playing that night. And I said, sure, yeah, no problem, I'll come down. Um, I made my way down there, and I, I believe I ended up taking the bus to get to the facility because I was 18 but didn't own a car. Went down to the facility and I saw Peter. And I'm like, hi, Peter. And he's like, great, I'll guide you through this. And he guided me through the first show I did with the replacements, which was, from an 18-year-old's perspective, I had no idea who this band was. Um, I connected the name of Paul Westerberg with a classmate, Mary Westerberg, uh, only after. Um, didn't realize they were related. Knew Peter, of course, um, and we did a show. You know, it was a packed house and. Which, what uh, year was this? This was, this would have to have been 1983 or 4. It would so have to be, it was, it would have been nine, spring, uh, let it be, yeah, let it be just about to be released, I believe. Okay. Um, and, I, you know, I'm like, this is great. Um, of course, there was m much hoorah about the success of the show and I'm still kind of without a clue as to what this means and who this who these people are really are. Uh, let me just ask for a question. Is, could this have been, um, <laughs> we have a lot of Duffy stories and, um, and and I love the idea that this is the potentially, you know, this is the potentially true story of the replacements. Right. Um, and none of the Duffy stories even come close to matching. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> um, which is kind of funny, um, which is sort of what I'm enjoying in this, the, the, the Rashomon kind of thing. But uh, by any chance, you know if this was that big Friday night gig that was free admission, but, and it was just like packed? Well, it was packed. Yeah. Um, do I recall that it was Friday night or free admission? Friday night? Uh... Strong possibility because I was asked on the way home that night. Mm -hmm. I mean, I of course now it's after bus time, so I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get from one side of Minneapolis to the other side of Minneapolis, mm -hmm. and didn't really as much as I hitchhiked at that time. I didn't think it'd be wise to hitchhike at that time. Um, so I got a ride from somebody, and on the ride I got asked by Peter, "Hey, are you free tomorrow?" Mm -hmm. Now, whether it was tomorrow or the next day, I'm not real clear, but it was like, yeah, I, I'm free to go. And he's like, okay, we'll pick you up. We're going to Madison. And it kind of, it wasn't any kind of official, we're going to pick you up to do this. It was more of, we're just going to, you know, we're just going to invite you along and use your talents or skills mm -hmm. for the foreseeable future or for this, at least this weekend, yeah. maybe the next weekend. And when 
I think when it was found out that I didn't actually drink and they knew I could drive, it was like, there's the golden boy. We're going to pick that guy up because we don't have to worry about it and everybody else can do what they want to do. So so it's a very strong possibility it was that particular mm -hmm. show. I do recall it being incredibly packed. Mm -hmm. And it was a close to the course to the university campus. Well, was that the first time you had ever heard of? No, the, the the mix. I mean, the, I mean, uh, why did they ask you? To, I mean, well, because, oh, so my background to that right. is that I did do a lot of mixing and okay. did a lot of theater work um, prior to that. I worked mm -hmm. with several bands in my high school, and of course, we tried to do our own things. And Minneapolis at that time had a pretty reasonable, a decent indie scene, mm -hmm. and you know, we played whatever gigs we could play, and uh, you know. Maybe I would make a hundred bucks a week. Maybe I'd make a hundred bucks a month. It was you know, no sure thing, and it was of course you know you get to play once or twice a month, so there's not enough turnover in actual gigs to make money. Right. So, um, so yeah, I was asked to come along. So I drove to Madison, and we did something on River Street. I don't even know the name of the club. Uh, and then, oh, by the way, we're going to the Cubby Bear in Chicago. Can you come along? It's like, yeah, sure, no problem. And I, you know, whether my skills were good or bad, uh, I seemed to hit a click with the actual, the actual band. Mm -hmm. Got, they, you know, they liked the results. The musicians liked the results. The, the, uh, the, the fans liked the results. I enjoyed the energy of the environment. Um, still not really realizing, you know, that this is the big band or one of the big bands from Minneapolis. You know, the, the rivalry between Who's Could Do and the replacements was pretty strong. And, um, I, you know, I, I had a great time in that first few days, but I didn't really realize that this was going to become a long-term thing. It was, once again, kind of seat of the pants. Very, very seat of the pants. So, what happened next? Um, well, it... it <laughs> What happened next? We got back from our my first weekend gig with them, uh, and I asked Peter about you know the formalities of this and you know the per diem, per, particular per diem mm -hmm. of the you know the 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 tour at the time or the the events at the time. I think it was fifteen dollars a day, and that was for show days, of course, which means if there were four shows a week, I was making sixty bucks a week, and that's not great. It's not bad. But it would mean that I would need to do something other than that. Yeah. Um, and I did. I, I kind of just did other bands around town and developed my my name around town. Um, we did several longer event tours or longer stints. And once again, I, I was unaware, really unaware of the, the magnitude of the press, the magnitude of the review, the magnitude of... The critical audience saying, you know, this is something to be watching, right. and it didn't really occur to me that you know there would be somebody in the audience that would be thinking about signing these guys to a deal. You know, I wasn't warned or informed. I can recall one occasion in New York City when they thought that there was going to be somebody in the audience that would be interested in. Was that the CBGB show? Uh, it was not the CBGB show. It was another location. Do not know the name of the particular place. Um, the CV Shibi shows were did, did a few of them there, and Alex Chilton did one opening there, and that was you know those shows were much more relaxed. There was much more uh, interaction with the audience, and I think the intimacy of the actual environment was much more attractive mm -hmm. to the band and, and to and to the audience also. Um, it was a I, I don't want to overstate the the the. The simplicity of the of the mind that I had at that time, but I really did not think it was going to be something that we'd be talking about today. Which is kind of, I mean, you know, if I had taken a journal every day and I'd written something down every day and kind of said, you know, here's here's what we ran into, um, you know, just watched John Lee Hooker open up and you know, or just you know, just saw Pete Buck talking to Paul backstage or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. You know, now it means something, but at that time, I was too dumb to realize when, <laughs> how cool it was. When did well? I mean, okay. So you're mixing this band for the first time. First time you really your first exposure to them. What did you think of the band? What did I think of the band? Um, well, I didn't. I after I told my my own network, my friends at the time of who I was working with and what I was doing. You know, because well, back up. Since I did not drink, 
Mm -hmm. I did not do a lot of the social gathering at clubs. I would only go to clubs to work. Yeah. Um, so my friends who were going to social clubs, going to clubs for the social aspect of it would tell me like, oh my God, you know, I've heard that they're like the craziest band ever. They get naked and they run around and they just play crazy covers and they don't play anything straight. And what's it like? And of course I hadn't quite seen that portions of that. Yeah. But you, you can't, you know, th those kinds of stories come from a single incident within a spectrum of days or weeks or months. Mm -hmm. um, so I was watching for those things and kind of almost expected those things to occur. Mm -hmm. When they did occur, it was, oh, okay, so Bob's wearing a tutu. Cool. That's what I expected. Okay. You know, the, the inside component of that is did, you know, off stage, off performance, there was, that was where to me the real insight and the real observations came in. Because watching him on stage was something that, that the audience also saw. And it was about Paul and the, the band performing what they wanted to perform at the time. Mm -hmm. Not, I'm going to get this song out and I'm going to put this emotion to the song. It's like, I'm just going to have fun. And if I'm pissed off, I'm going to share my anger with the audience. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm having a fun time, I'm just going to have fun and I don't really care. Yeah. And that I don't really care is the mantra it is the i don't really care we don't really care what you guys think we're having fun we're not here to entertain you this isn't a spectacle mm -hmm. even though it may be a spectacle it isn't about being a spectacle it's about us having a good time getting through the night making some money so i can make tomorrow's rent or i can mm -hmm. get another whatever hit whatever it might be yeah um I don't know if that answers the question directly or not, and I may have gone way off topic no, here. No, it's, it's okay. I mean, it's um, so to give you a little more background about myself, uh, I lived with a during high school. I lived with a friend of mine whose parents had an opera company, which is kind of an, an interesting twist in in the world. Um, they did a very light opera, a lot of Gilbert and Sullivan, and they the facility they actually did their opera in, they decided they would open a non-alcoholic club called the Bataclan. Mm -hmm. The Bataclan was open for a very short period of time, and they had, as one of their musical guests, was a band called The Impediments. And The Impediments were put off stage before they even got on because they brought alcohol into a non-alcoholic club. And I was actually doing lights for that particular event, and we ended up not having a show that night, which is the quote-unquote first replacement show before they actually became the replacements. Wow. Which is a small world, and it was not that I was there because you know, I got into the replacements because of that. It was like completely separate events. That was on 79 or 81 or somewhere in there. So this is prior to... Sorry, Ma, or don't yeah, ask, yeah. or any of the, any anything, and the so going through my theatrical career, I've got a level of professionalism that I've maintained, and I'm going on going on tour with this band, thinking, okay, we're gonna, it's going to be this, and I've you know I've heard about opera tours, and I've heard about rock tours, and I've heard about whatever kind of tours, and I'm thinking it's going to be something like this, and it has turned out to be nothing like that. It was much more a family going on a road trip or a camping trip. So, I mean, and that's, you know, I don't know if that gives you any little bit of insight, but I'm thinking about it being, you know, I'm thinking about, I'm not really thinking about my career, what it's going to be like in the future. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, you know, great, we're going to go to this place. I'm not going to look around the town. I've never been there before. Cool. I hope they have pineapple juice at the bar. Really simple, mm -hmm. very narrow focus, very short term event horizon. Can we make it through the night? Where do we get guitar strings? Do I have no guitar picks? Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff. But I'm also thinking about, okay, how do I make this more professional when if the band wants to be almost the opposite? So well, Not that wants to be, but they just are. Yeah, I, I, to take it from someone who wouldn't know what your job entails, what did you, what, when you worked with bands subsequently in the future, uh, and, you know, the way, what would, what's the professional way that you expected it to happen? And tell us how, it differed. Well, <laughs> um, I remember you talking to this on the phone. Right. Like, okay. So an example of an example of a level of professionalism versus a, a level of running by the seat of your pants would mm -hmm. be if 
I'm going into a facility, let's just say that we're going to go do an acoustic performance and I'm going to run sound and you're going to sit down with your guitar, a microphone for your guitar, a microphone for your vocal, and you're going to play 12 songs or whatever it might be, or three songs. You're going to go in hopefully having some experience of the environment, knowing how loud you need to be, maybe knowing if you can hear yourself when you're strumming, if it's going to be boomy on the stage, whatever it might be. And we would actually go in and do a quote unquote a sound check where I would be able to hear stuff and go, okay, well, I know when there's going to be 250 people in here, it's going to sound a different way, but I think I've got a good grasp of what it is that I need to do in order to make it so that from first note to last note, it's a good performance mm -hmm. because I'm thinking about performance. And that, for no reason other than we couldn't get to the facility in time or we just didn't want to take the time to do a sound check sound checks were not done which is an interesting perspective from the professional's perspective he's mm -hmm. like oh well gee, you know i i don't really want to look bad so i want to make i want to get a chance to try it out to see what happens the other side of that is you know it's performance art you get in there swim throw you off the boat in the middle of the lake swim to shore you'll figure it out if you don't you'll drown well i'm not going to die mm -hmm. I might be embarrassed, but at the same time, I'm 18 years old and I don't really care. So the, we're having fun, we don't care, we're doing it for ourselves, was very infectious. Didn't ruin me, well, I don't think. But, but at the same yeah. time, it was really kind of like, you know, we don't need to do a sound check. We know what we're going to do. And it's like, you know what? I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. if, this first, if you don't care about the first song coming off with, a, with vocals, I'm cool. Yeah. Now, did they ever do any sound checks? I mean, even bigger places? Or? Some places there were sound checks done. I'm only sure. because it was more of let's get up and see if we're, you know, how we're doing. How yeah. we're doing. It's not about we're going to give you the opportunity to actually test out the equipment. It's more about I want to work on something or we're going to figure out if this works because we're going to be so much further apart. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, playing the Metro is a big stage in Boston and it has, you know, does it fit our, in, you know, we're... Typically tight, we're kind of want to be together. I, I mean, having worked around bands and seen bands for many, many, many decades, it seems now, uh, I, I found that there are some bands that'll play a club and they have no idea how to control their stage volume. That which is in a small room is usually the hardest thing. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it seems that like people are like it's like there's a volume war going on between right. bass drums or two guitar players or what you know. Uh, I take it that these guys probably didn't worry too much about. Their stage volume, or no. I'm thinking about smaller clubs. No, <laughs> no. But at the same time, I yeah. mean, it, part of the reason that that wouldn't necessarily matter is because it was a wall to wall. You know, playing Maxwell's, mm -hmm. the room is well, not very big. Not very yeah, big, I know right? Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a there's an entrance by by the stage that lets you get to the rest of the space, and then it's basically this narrow, teeny little room, and yeah. it's like wall to wall people. So whatever right. stage volume was being absorbed right at the front, right. and if I could get vocals over the top of that, I was winning. Okay. You know that well, as much as there was a desire to have some special effects, echoes, and yeah, certain yeah. things on certain songs, you know, it was we were. I was very lucky to be in the position of getting a mix that was attractive to a lot of people mm -hmm. and I was lucky to basically, you know, beat down the stage volume. So now, you, you said a lot of the insight to the band came backstage. Of course. Yeah. That's where the majority of the time yeah. is. Tell tell us tell us and again, I'm not looking as I've said to you, I'm not looking for, I don't, I don't care who did drugs, I don't care who did stuff like that, because it's like, they're a rock and roll band, they're supposed to do drugs. It's like, you know, if you're going to, unless you can tell me that they were, they actually like sat in the van and drank tea and read Bible quotes, then I want to know that. But, but I want to know more about, who did these guys listen to? I mean, what were they like? What did they joke about? What was a, what was a running gag that went with the, you know, with the band? Um, the, the funny side, I mean, did, did they love a certain TV show? I mean, was there something... Some weird little insights into TV. It. I don't remember TV being much of a. I don't remember TV being much at all. Um, who, who do we listen to? Who do, who do we listen to? Uh, lots of T Rex, of course. Some Robin Hitchcock. I was exposed to Robin Hitchcock. I often dream of trains was played incessantly. Um, yeah. Um, you know, do we listen to a lot of classic Elvis? Oh yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
And a bunch of stuff, of course, that I would, I would. Ne- you're talking Presley. You're not talking. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it, really listening to a lot of old blues and a lot of old, old, older rock and roll at the time. Was that coming from Jesperson? I don't think so. A lot of the selections were coming from Paul, mm-hmm. and you know, a pile, of, a box of cassettes. You know, don't dare put anything in there that would you, you wanted to keep because if it was unlike, it got thrown out the window. So. You know, make sure that if you if you're putting something in there, you don't care about it. Um, it yeah, there was. You know, I, I was exposed to a lot of music that I did not know about and found later on in life to be. I'm very appreciative of it. I mean, right. I've seen Robin Hitchcock 17 times. It's just like I'm so grateful. Mm-hmm. Um, the the, the the dirty laundry stories. I, I'm not a dirty laundry kind of guy. Yeah, that's but, what I'm saying. It's like I'm not. Uh, and I don't really care about who did drugs either. That yeah. stuff doesn't matter to me. What did surprise me was the the level of um or I should say the, the threshold of where I didn't realize that they were intoxicated, but they were, mm-hmm. and watching them do. You know, I I, I watched. Two of them do twenty-one tequila poppers with a liter of two liter of Seven Up and a bottle, and I'm just like, how can you guys, you know, how can you get up and walk down the hall into the van and get to the club and actually perform? Didn't ask those questions, but now when I look back at it, of course, I'm like, oh my god, you know, ten shots of tequila should kill somebody. Mm. I I remember Jack Rabbit, who used to drink with them a lot, said that he, you know, he's like, I can hold down my beers, but it's just like it was four or five to one to, with, with them. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, that was, and that was a little bit of a surprise to me. I was like, you know, I've, I'd heard that, you know, there's crazy stuff going on and, you know, in the rock and roll world. And of course I expect to see some of it, but when I actually kind of calculated, I'm just like, wow. And you're not talking big guys either. I mean, they're no, were, Paul no. and Tommy were pretty damn skinny. Right. Well, yeah. Chris wasn't big. Yeah, Bob yeah. was the big, Bob yeah. was big, but uh, yeah, I mean, all of them were, you know, starving musicians as yeah. it were. Um, um, there's a horse walking by outside. Um, the, the only other thing is that, you know, once again, this is like a family camping trip. It's, it's not a great analogy, but it really is like that. It's like, you know, if we don't get to shower for a few days, that's just how it is. Mm -hmm. When you're 18, it, it doesn't seem to matter. You know, nowadays it's a different thing for me, but you know, I don't think I saw Bob take off his shoes for many days in a row. He would sleep in bed with his shoes on. Mm -hmm. He would, well, Bob was an interesting character and I miss him dearly. He did some strange stuff. His personal body functions were no longer personal, Mm -hmm. which was a very interesting observation. But once again, you know, I'm, I'm very young. I'm like, is this what it's supposed to be like? I've seen opera and everybody's professional and I've seen the <laughs> rock and roll world and it's completely the opposite. Is this normal or is it not normal? Yeah. And so it is, it was kind of a eye opener, but at mm. the same time it's like, yeah, well that's how it's supposed to be. No so, big deal. So if, if it's a family trip, who's the mom, who's the pa, who's the, 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 the weird uncle, who's the, the bratty kid? Who's the weird uncle? Well, um, <laughs> who's the weird uncle? It was not, I shouldn't say it was a family camping trip. It was more like a rejects of the Boy Scouts camping trip. <laughs> and that's kind of a bad way to put it. But that's, but, the, but that's, <laughs> who's the weird uncle? It was not, I shouldn't say it was a family camping trip. It was more like a rejects of the Boy Scouts camping trip. <laughs> And that's kind of a bad way to put it, but that's but the, but that gets you where you're at. It's like there's the crazy uncle or or the I want to be the good uncle. Yeah. Taking every, all the boys out for and that's Jesperson. That's Jesperson. Okay. Who's you know like I'm gonna I gotta call your moms so don't get out of the van. Yep, we're okay. We're doing great. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. I mean, of course that didn't happen, but that's kind of where it was. Mm-hmm. Paul was uh, Paul was. I wouldn't say sullen, but just kind of introspective and kind of thinking mm-hmm. about things and, and working in his mind. And Tommy and Bob and Chris were going crazy. And, you know, to the point of, well, so an, as an example of a story, uh, 
after have, having done several shows that spring, that summer, uh, I was given the opportunity, as it was or not, to go out to Iowa with the band. They had to play an outdoor festival, outdoor somewhere in Ames, Iowa, so probably the campus there. And we played outdoors. On the way there, um, of course, a lot of uh, alcohol was consumed actually in the van when it was being driven. Um, it was not illegal at that time. Uh, <laughs> And uh, <laughs> it wasn't real recent that you, could, you that you couldn't drink a, a, <laughs> in a van while driving. Yeah. Anyway, um, no. So uh, you know the 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 pent up energy that occurred when taking long road trips. Um, you know we have to be there at a certain time. No, we can't stop. No, we've got to keep going. So you know, me as the straight guy who's driving is like, I'm sorry, guys. Open the door, piss out the side. We can't stop. We gotta get to the club, or we gotta get to the gig. Mm-hmm. We just don't have time. And that happened re- repeatedly. Mm-hmm. So on a particular trip down to Ames, uh, I, I distinctly remember there being some kind of wrestling match going on in the back, and of course the door flying open and stuff starting to fly out the side of the van, beer bottles or you know, cans or trash or whatever it might be, and then this person's shirt, and then this person's pants, and this person's pants, and this person's shirt, and of course now they're all in their skivvies, and I'm the one driving, of course, I have my clothes on still. And th- th- there was no concern of, we could die. I mean, we can't, we can't die. <laughs> Nothing will happen, right? Mm-hmm. I'll be able to recover from whatever kind of stuff you do to me, so go ahead and try to take my clothes off. And they did. They actually did. And they actually got my clothes off and threw them out the window. So now we're all driving down the road with no clothes on. And this is a day gig. We're not really expecting to be staying overnight. Yeah, a fascinating... No suitcases. No, no, why, no. This is, we're going down for the day. We're going to play the gig. We're going to drive back that night. And yeah, I mean, it's just like... And that... What did you do? Um, Bob probably just played in his underwear, it, right? it, uh, Yeah, Bob went through with it. I, um, honestly, I don't recall what we did. We did end up actually getting some clothing and we did actually end up, uh, getting into trouble with the law in that particular event also. And, you know, and those kinds of things were, if once the, once the energy was to a certain level or the rowdiness or the craziness or whatever you want to call it, once the energy was a certain level, that would carry forward into performance and even after performance and then mm-hmm. whatever the next day might bring. So, and that's kind of where once things got out of hand, I, I use that's a terrible term because it wasn't really out of hand. It was just once things got to kind of a crazy level, mm-hmm. that just kept going. You know, you egg me on, I egg you on, and we just right, keep right. kind of ratcheting it up. You know, as, as, as you mentioned, it's like a five to one. Yeah, I can outdo you. Mm-hmm. I can always outdo you. Watch this. Yeah. Crazy. Do you remember what the... Was the trouble with the law a frequent thing? Mm, well, the trouble with the... the any, any trouble with the law was typically very incidental-based. Speeding, mm-hmm. open bottle, trouble on stage, etc. Yeah. Um, I can distinctly remember three... Uh, I can distinctly remember three events... One is this uh, Ames show where we were playing, Bob got pissed off about something, do not know what, and destroyed his wedge monitor in front of him. And the, the, the sound company, furious, comes to me and says, hey, I need you to pay for that. It's going to be $200 or whatever the number was. And I'm like, oh, I don't have any cash. I've got nothing. I've got a credit card that I can buy gas with on the way home. I'm expecting you to get a check from the venue what can I do? I can't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. He called the police and the police surrounded our van and would not let us leave because we hadn't paid for this. And it came down to me negotiating with the person saying, look, my word that we will pay you for this. I, I will personally pay you for this. We don't have any cash. We've got nothing on us. You're welcome to do whatever you'd like, but we're just going to stay here because we've got nothing else we can do. We did get out of that without... Mm-hmm without too much difficulty, but you could see the glee in the eyes of the sheriff baseball cap yeah. hoping to do something with these hooligans. Yeah. Um, one, one more story on the, uh, the, the police. Driving in downtown Chicago, not knowing what I was looking for at the time, um, 
and unbeknownst to me, of course, there was open bottles in the back of the van. Um, I had no idea. Um, we got pulled over. And, you know, Chicago police, the fine gentlemen that they are, uh, realized our per predicament. When, when, <laughs> when I got out of the van, I was driving, when I got out of the van and uh, Carlson got out of the van, Tom Carlson got out of the van, uh, we were both taken to the back of the squad car and we were told, basically, here's the situation. You guys have an open bottle. There's probably drugs in your van. We don't even have to go in it to know what, that this is, you're going to be in huge trouble. Mm -hmm. You're a long ways from home. You're going to have to come back, be arraigned. Then you're going to have to come back and you're going to have to go to court and you're going to have to, you know, who knows what's going to happen there. And when they find you guilty, because it's obvious, you're going to have to serve some time. So we're going to let you guys think about this for a few minutes and we're going to go back and take a look in the van. And they reached through the little open window and opened up the little uh, cigarette holder in the back of their seat and then got out of their car. And we were in the back of the car and Tom Carlson looks at me and goes, how much money you got? And I, I don't know, like 20 bucks or whatever. And he's like, okay, I got it. I got a little more. Let's put, let's put the money in and we'll close this and we'll be out of this. And I'm looking at him like, what are you talking about? <laughs> And lo and behold, they came back, they saw the little thing was closed, they opened the thing up and they said, gentlemen, thank you so much, enjoy Chicago, and they let us go. And, <laughs> and, and that's, that's the kind of education I got. Not that I could always bribe a cop, not that I could, you know, ever probably get away with anything like that ever again in my life, but... That was kind of the seat of your pants, quick thinking, make sure you make it up because mm -hmm. if you're not making it up, who's going to make it up? I mean, it's, it, to me, and it's like everyone I've talked to, it's like, I mean, if, if you look up, that I'll, I'll use a complete, if you look up rock and roll in the dictionary, you should see a picture of these four guys. I agree. Because that is, they embodied what the rock and roll spirit is. Which, I mean, because to me, I hate, there's nothing more I hate than rock and roll with, like, like shows and someone hits their mark. And it's like, that's not fucking rock and roll. It's like, I'm seeing a Broadway play. It's opera. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's a musical. And it's like, it's like, it, 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 the chaos is, is you know, it, is what I think is part of, well, a big part of their charm. You know, and, and why people, you know, what well, made them. Well, why do people go to watch race car driving? Why... For what purpose? I mean, watching somebody go around a track, you know, there's a lot of skill involved in it. Don't get me wrong. I'm impressed by somebody who can actually sit in a car for several hours with, you know, incredible G-force and yeah. incredible concentration. But from a spectator's point of view, what's the point? Yeah. They're going around in a circle. But there, I think there, there, there's that glimmer of hope that something crazy is going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's the crash, it's the excitement of the moment, whatever it might be. That is kind of where, you know, as I said, my friends asked me, so what happened? Yeah. It's like, well, they played a gig. Well, I mean, I think the thing with the Mets is that if, if they didn't crash, well, your, your alternative, well, you're going to see the greatest rock and roll band to ever play. They play a great show. Right. So it was, it was, it was, you know, it was a win-win situation. I mean, you, it was no matter what you were seeing. I mean, I, I actually have enjoyed both kinds of shows, you know, uh, I mean, you Put a gun in my head. I probably was. I would probably absolutely pick the, 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 play the songs. You know, kind of you know, show with a few covers thrown in as opposed to the complete opposite. But um, see, I, mean, I would pick this exactly the opposite. I, I mean, the Shit It's the Fans tape is the quintessential show for me, where they get on stage and they ask for what to be played, and mm -hmm. somebody always yells out "customer" or "fuck school," and and it's like, yeah, maybe. But, you know, if you threw out something crazy that, you know, clam bake or who knows what it might be, and they, 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 it sparks something in one of them, and they just start doing it, and they all fall in together, and they kind of pick it up, and they play, you know, the, the first verse and the first chorus, and mm -hmm. then it falls apart. That, to me, is what rock and roll is, and that, to me, is where the magic occurred with mm -hmm. that band. It wasn't the fact that they could put together great songs. Mm -hmm. They could do that. But lots of bands can do that. It's very difficult for a band to be willing to fall flat in their face and get up and do it again mm -hmm. and again and again. That right there is what makes me go, these guys are great. Okay, you bring up uh, Chin Hits the Van. 
That's, you have a good story about that because I don't think it wouldn't exist without you. Okay, I, I'll accept that. And I'm, I don't have a large ego that I'm aware of, but I might. Um, the, the story behind it is we're coming home from, uh, for sake of argument, an extended run across the country and we're playing Oklahoma and we stop at this place and, um, or at Lincoln, Nebraska, I'm, I'm sorry, I may be confused here. In any case, we're playing a place that is pretty much wound down. Spring break is either occurring or it's right around when there's nobody in this particular college town mm -hmm. and this particular location happens to have nobody visiting it. So there's very, very few people in the audience. And if you listen to the tape, you can hear Paul ask for the people to move closer. They don't gotta, but he really wants it to be more intimate because they really enjoyed that wall of people in front of them. They're sweating, the, the audience sweating. They, they really preferred that. Anyway, uh, I'm playing, I'm mixing the show and this particular location is a big square room and has a balcony above me. And I decide that I'm gonna walk around and listen to the show and see what I hear. And I walk up and, you know, anytime, uh, a show is being recorded, you know, the objective is to stop that from occurring. Bootlegging is not acceptable. We're taking that. And I happen to confiscate this tape from this guy. It, you know, where it ends is where it ends, uh, beautifully. Um, and we listen to it on the way home. And while we're listening to it, Chris it, it starts to draw a drawing that he it turns into the cover art for uh, for the the cassette. tape, the cassette. And we get back to Minneapolis and I've got this cassette. We, I give it to Steve Felstead. He masters it over to, onto some bigger tape. And then from there I get the cassette back. And when I get it back, it's being listened to by Paul and gets a little actual erasure in it. And it's, uh, it's a story where I'm, I mean, my part is pretty in insignificant i mean in all honesty it's i i happen to pick up a cassette from somebody who was making a tape of the show and it happens to sound really good you know that just it just it just happened what you remember what kind of cassette recorder you would have been using to even get a decent sound uh i don't think it was necessarily the recorder i believe it was the particular location where this where this particular person was mm -hmm. i mean obviously he was using some better end equipment right um but he was just dumping it to a cassette and you know, a Max L cassette well, is what a Max L cassette is. Is that why it, it, the last song just cuts off? Yes. Because that's where you I pull it open out. it up and pull it out. Oh, okay. Because it's just like that. It's just literally like 11 or 14 seconds or something of the last song right. there. And it's like... Yeah. Or, yeah. So, yeah. So, in, in, I mean... What, what, were there, was, you, was that the very end of the show? I mean, was there more songs? No, there was more songs after that. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it, and in that, that particular show, I mean, it, there was, the energy in that was down, even though it may not sound like it in the particular show. The energy of that event was down, not a lot of audience, which always makes it down, and tired. The guys are tired. Um, we get back to Minneapolis, I think there's a break for a week or two weeks, and during that time is when we decided to put this cassette out, and I don't know how long it took to actually duplicate and start distributing the cassette, but it, it you know, it, you it, there isn't a lot of magic behind it. It's just yeah. a story, and I'm, I don't want to make this sound like it's not a big deal because to some people it's a huge deal. I mean, it is one of those things where you just happen to be at the right place at the right time doing the right band, and you happen to see the wrong guy doing the wrong thing, and you take it from him. And also, I mean, really, when does a record label put out their own bootleg? I've never really heard of that before. You know, I mean, now it's it's. I mean, now it bands is. do it all the time. I mean, they're they're putting out you know their official bootleg recordings of so and so. You know, right. Pearl Jam, Bob Dylan. But it's like here you had and, and weren't they all distributed free to press? Yes, I believe they were. Right. So I mean, you basically had a record label giving away a bootleg, which was sort of went with the band. Right. <laughs> right. Right. You know. Right. Um, but I don't know if this was the same tour. There is a legendary story. Uh, I mean, Bob has done a lot of things on stage. There's a legendary San Diego show, which I thought might have been the Let It Be tour. Okay. Where Bob decided to play completely stark naked except for his guitar. Okay. That, that isn't the only time, but okay. okay. And someone supposedly, during a guitar solo, threw a sneaker at him. He caught it, urinated in it, threw it back to the crowd, and finished the solo. 
Oh my god. <laughs> I haven't heard that story. Okay. Um, but it would not surprise me if it was true. I didn't know if you just happened. I would, I would love to hear if you would say, oh yeah, I was there. <laughs> oh, I wish I could say that I was. Yeah. I would remember that. Um, no, but that's very much like what Bob would do. I mean, he was about going beyond mm -hmm. to show you that, you know, you can, you can dare me to do anything and I will do it. I, I actually want to do a quick cut of things. I mean, it's like you're trying to make, you obviously want to make some lighter moments and it's like, I want to do a quick cut of like what Bob was wearing and just cut the people just saying tutu about a wedding dress, blah, 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 blah. What, what were some of the weirdest things you ever saw him wear on stage? Uh, uh, Dr. Seuss leotard. You know, the white cat in the hat, white and red stripes. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, he was, he was red, converse, all stars, not high tops, sometimes high tops, um, which would, turned out to be more black than red because they were so dirty. He never took them off. As I mentioned before, mm -hmm. it's like he would sleep in his clothes all the time. And I, I, I never saw him take a shower, which is, I mean, I'm not that I'm, you know, worried about that, but it's like, wow. Mm -hmm. That's just, it's just, he's just, he was just so focused on his, his universe and his universe uh, didn't involve certain components of self-awareness. I think that's an appropriate mm -hmm. way to put that maybe. Any other interesting outfits? Oh, let's see, what else did he wear? The tutu is the one that I love the most, so I'm real. I can just see that one in my mind. He wore a cape several times, um, and I, I don't know where that came from or where he got that. Mm -hmm. Like a Superman kind of cape. Kind of like a Superman cape, but it was, but not red. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't see the color, but I can see that he was wearing. A, I can see my mind wearing this cape. Yeah, he 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 was about the he was about the performance. He was mm -hmm. about I'm gonna perform for myself and and be what I'm going to be. Is there something behind me? Oh yeah, that. well I mean uh, the dog my goat and a horse yeah. running around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. What in in chickens? <laughs> oh yeah, I got a bunch of animals. We have a bunch of animals. Oh, yeah, it's like, no, I, hard. Yeah, it's like play. completely. Yeah, yeah, here I am touring with a rock and roll band, and I'm out with a farm now. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. Um, that tour, and again, I'm not sure if it's a, a, there's so many shows that people talk about, but if you, I'm, 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 I'm just want to bring up a few of the ones that I, people talk about a lot. City Gardens. Uh, New Jersey? In New Jersey. Were you? Butthole Surfers opened up for it? I believe so, yes. And yes. Uh, that was the show where the, on the way home, uh, the guy who promoted the show badmouthed the band on the radio, and you guys were listening to it on the radio? I do recall that. Okay, let's let's talk about that show. Oh. Uh, this show is, this is one of those great, I have five different versions of this show. So it'd be love to have it from someone who was in the band. Um, okay, first off, was it a completely drunk and obnoxious show, or was yes. it? Yes, it was. Okay. Yes, this is, uh, and of course, it, uh, it's all somewhat of a blur of which you know how much they drink before this show versus this show versus mm -hmm. this show. Um, this is a show that I recall there being a lot of drinking before, and there were actually, I believe, two opening acts in that particular event: Butthole Surfers, and I do not recall the other band. Mm -hmm. um, and I recall it being not long, not a normal length to, uh, event. Um, stumbling drunk, I guess, mm -hmm. which didn't happen often. Um, and I, what I mean by stumbling drunk is that not you know not physically unable, but in a, in a, to, a, to me the stumbling drunk, a stumbling drunk show would have been where they couldn't sync together. They couldn't put it together for them to each other. You know, like if, if Chris can't connect up with Tommy, then it isn't a song. That to that point of them all being intoxicated to that level, that's what that show was about. That show was about I'm gonna see we're gonna see how far we can go. Mm -hmm. And it could be just because they didn't get on stage for so long, or it could be just because they didn't give a rat's ass or whatever happened a night before. Right. Right. Unknown where those that, that came from. Um a lot of times there was other besides alcohol there was other stuff involved and it could be that that wasn't involved in that particular night so the energy was different mm -hmm. um, I don't have you know I, I can't recall anything other than them not connecting and not really 
from my perspective, gelling the way I think they would have gelled and in a better, better performance. I'm not going to say it was bad. Right, right. But it wasn't, to me, it wasn't as memorable because there wasn't as much camaraderie. Mm -hmm. Now, so you had this show. Uh, do you remember anything about the promoter being, Randy Ellis was the promoter. I, I don't remember anything about him being upset at the venue. Right. I mean, because there was no... You know, no fisticuffs, yeah, yeah. which could have easily happened if Bob had gotten involved. Mm -hmm. um, so there, you know, there, that. Yeah, I'm. I don't recall there being anything bad blood at the show, but at the same time, it's like he ex he may have expected. I'm not. This is pure conjecture. Yeah. He may have expected something to occur, and you know, the fact that they didn't do as long a performance may have done something for him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I you know, I don't know that part because I didn't see that part. Right. Now, so you're driving home in the van, and you put on whatever radio station it is, and you hear the promoter call in, complaining about how horrible the show was. <laughs> What's the reaction? I think the reaction from uh, some members of the of the some participants in the van was probably disregard, and I mean, because honestly, the the whole don't care attitude mm -hmm. was pretty pervasive. I think that uh, to heart, it probably hurt a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, Paul was very private. He didn't share that kind of, you know, did he really want to be loved and liked and, and get approval or did he not? He appeared like he didn't care. And I think a lot of the times he didn't care because of anger, not because, mm -hmm. you know, he was he said, I don't care, because he didn't want to show that he really did care. Mm -hmm. Was there any truth to uh, the band, the, you guys pulling over and uh, one of the guys, I might have been Westbrook, I don't know, uh, calling up Jesperson and telling him about this and breaking up? No. Okay. No, that I'm not aware of. Because at that particular, well, no, I don't, not, I'm not, don't know that that's true or not. Okay. Okay. Um, did uh, you mention uh, fisty cups could have happened? <laughs> were there a lot of fights with promoters who were like, "What the fuck did you guys just give me?" And I'm not paying for that or whatever. The 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 all of that kind of transaction would have occurred outside of my purview, only because I shouldn't say that, that that transaction. If somebody, you know, if I was to be the one who was to be paid, then I would be the one who went yeah. and said, "Your promoter, time to give me the check." Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you're pissed off, blah, blah, blah. And, it, or that would have been Peter or some other person mm -hmm. at that time. Um, if it were in my purview, then I would have definitely seen that. And I've seen, but I, and I haven't seen Bob get in the face of any promoter. I've seen him get in the face of, well, in the, the, the Iowa show, get in the face of the sound gentleman and, mm -hmm. and the security there and, and just being obnoxious. I hadn't seen, I didn't, never saw him got in front of, get in front of uh, any of the, okay any of the promoters directly, yeah. but it may have been outside my purview too, because a lot of things do occur. Come backstage, I want to, you know, give you a line mm -hmm. and talk a little bit. Now, um, were you on the road with the band, uh, with the band when RJ Smith was following along doing the piece for Village Voice? I believe the answer is yes. Okay. Um, cause he talks at length in his article about, uh, what I believe was, and was it, an Iowa show, some at some place I thought it was Iowa, where uh, band was not in the mood to play, and majority of people started leaving. And Westerberg looked out into the audience and said something to the effect of, "I see there's still a few of you here. We haven't done our jobs yet." And they proceeded to play worse. Worse. <laughs> I mean, do you remember anything? Or is that? I mean, is that is that was that more than a? Did that happened more than once. I mean, well, in a, in a in, we played a lot of outdoor events that mm -hmm. particular summer and that was the don't care attitude of more mm -hmm. of like I'm going to do this for myself or I'm, we're going to do this for ourselves oh you're still here we must be doing something wrong mm -hmm. I mean I I can see that occurring uh there were several outdoor shows Des Moines uh maybe even Cedar Rapids Iowa where we played whatever the campus might have been whatever the festival might have been and you know as loud as they could make it as loud as they could make mm -hmm. it, trying to push people, I wouldn't say push people away, but they definitely did have a, 
I would disregard maybe a disregard for the audience. Um, yeah, no, because it, 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 it was it was a um, I think it's in there. Yeah, yeah, um, it, yeah. It was uh, I, I, did this, okay. I mean, did the disregard though? I mean, was there ever a point in time that, that you saw where? Hey, we gotta sell records. Are these people are buying tickets? Are these people are, are paying for us to be here? I that was never ever talked about publicly. Mm -hmm. No discussion in the van. You know the internal arguments between Peter and Paul. Maybe that was the case, mm -hmm. but I think that, and I you'll have to confirm this with others. But I think that the I think Peter was conflicted because of exactly what we think of being as rock and roll and commercialism mm -hmm. and this is so against commercialism but it's so beautiful um yeah we need to sell records mm -hmm. yeah we need to sell tickets people are coming to see something right after a certain line you know college radio plays lots of replacement songs and people are like oh my god i really want to see somebody i want to see him before my will there i gotta go see that i'm gonna go see that and of course then they wouldn't play it because it was the hit yeah. So there was a disregard with connecting to the audience that wanted to see them perform the art that they've created on record. They were a live band that was more about let's have fun doing stuff live. Mm -hmm. The disconnect that occurred, yeah, I don't think that they realized that there was a, a point at which they really should have, if they were going to do craziness, you know, sprinkle it with some sanity. Right, right. Be crazy all you want, but still play the hit. Right. At the end of the night for the encore or what have you. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. But of course, when you're using when you're using substances to get beyond control, it's hard to pull back into control and play something straight through. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I think that the people who wanted to see the show be crazy, mm -hmm. which the audience may have been mixed 50-50, I want to see the band play in a tutu, or I want to see the band get completely naked. I want to see Tommy smash into the audience. I want to see Paul just wailing, screaming, and playing covers right. versus the person who says, I love Westerberg songwriting, and I want to see him, you know, do weight or whatever they, you know, whatever they were going to play. This is, I, I just wanted, I, I just wanted to find, there's, I, I have the piece here with the, um, with the, with the, uh, here we go. It was in Ohio. Was that show actually? Was it Kent Falls, Ohio? Did you that sound? Kent Falls. Um, Kent State. Kent State is, is. I don't know if Kent State's outside of Columbus or not. Yeah. Okay, because we played. We it, it played was Kent, Ohio. Yes. In Kent, Ohio. Okay. Yeah. We. I have fond memories of Columbus, but uh, I do not recall Kent. But strong yeah. possibility. Yeah, where it's just in, in Paul, like just like saying we we can do this all night, you know, it's just, just of, like being obnoxious. But it was it was I just remember like it, this story was so vivid. I mean, it seemed like to be the one. It was the one thing that ended the piece. You know, um, we're gonna try to talk to RJ as well. So. Okay, the, yeah. you know, the thinking about doing in you know today musicians will do in store appearances or actually just do a tour of in stores, mm -hmm. whatever they might do, um, you know. The, the band didn't like to do that. They didn't like to do radio. They didn't like to do any of the promotional component that goes to actually promoting having a show. Um, you know, they kind of expected to be able to just walk into a facility, whatever that facility might be, whether it's you know a, a Seventh Street entry size place where they can only hold two hundred people, or Maxwell's, or some small place, or a big place, Palladium, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. They just be able to expect to walk in and do what they're going to do. And if the audience likes it, great. And if they don't, they don't. The, I, I, it, there was a record store called School Kids Records that uh, was in Columbus, and this isn't anything of a big story, but I distinctly remember there being a big connection there between them, that record store, and a few blocks away, a small club. I honestly do not remember the name of the club. Um, I could drive you there. <laughs> uh, in any case, you know, watching, you know, in that particular environment, the the magic of maybe having 200 people, 300 people in the audience and seeing X on stage with the replacements, you know, that's the thing for me that makes me go, 
I, I, well, I love this band. I love the ability that they can get on stage and they can actually, if they care to, make it real, make it very mm-hmm. artistic, make it a performance. Um, and they, they did that. At the same time, they were more about, they were just more about having a fun time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, what was the reaction? I mean, you're, you're on the Let It Be tour and Let It Be is getting crazy reviews. I mean, you know, Village Voice, I mean, Chris Cow gives it an A+. Plus. You know, names it second best record of the year after Springsteen's Born in the USA, which is, seems silly now, but um, <laughs> he, he stands by it, but I, and I really wanted to like say, when I said, I said, would you change your mind today? And he's like, no, I still stand by it. I really wanted to say to him, really? No, no come on. <laughs> it's, it's your chance to make it right. <laughs> but, you know, um, but I mean, but really, I mean, it, crazy reviews for this record. And how are we in time? Oh, all right, let's, let us switch tastes before I ask you another question. Give us a, let us take a break. Can I use it for a while? And I'm really intrigued by th- its appropriate use. I mean, basically, it's you're getting a sense of the character of this person by the, the, you know, the sum of all the parts, right. right? And that's kind of an interesting thought. It's like if the person is only giving us a little snippet each time and they can actually have a consistent voice through then, that then it becomes a novel then it becomes like, exactly yeah. so that, there's a there's a thing there that you know it's being made into a feature film it's a book too it's a memoir oh I had no so, idea so yeah they, 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 just, they just sold I the movie so rights wrong. two weeks ago that's so wrong it's the medium it's like <laughs> yeah. waiting for the next piece that's right. what's part of the love of it you know yeah. I, but, you, you, but I, you know, unfortunately oh, a lot of times so they, just, they just don't see that you know I mean well, because suites don't sell and ticket sales or movie theaters are 20 bucks a piece, so yeah. it makes a lot of sense to do that. We, you were going to ask me a question about something, and I now completely forgot what it was. Do you remember what it was? I have no idea. What, do you guys remember? You finished talking about uh, uh, Columbus. Um, uh, you had a question. What was the last thing we talked about? And then about? we yeah. stopped. The last thing was at 53 minutes, so around like 50 seconds before turning the tape off, and it was... Uh, Quote, in my words, the magic of seeing prolific performances, uh, but they were at the same time more about fun. And that's, that's what it kicked out. That's when it kicked out. Okay, well, uh, it'll probably either come to me or maybe this is. Well, let's just was. let's just continue on. Uh, are you guys crushed for time? You got to go see Terry. What time? Yeah, sorry. Four fifteen. Oh, okay. Time. Uh, and we already ate lunch. I so. have to. Uh, I have to stop at about three thirty because I got to. Oh, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll have to be out yeah. before then. So. Okay. Um, let's talk about. Uh, the way it ended. For me? Yeah. Horrible. I know. But it, but it, ended, it ended horrible for a, a bunch of people at that point. Cause, I mean, everything I'm, I'm, I've definitely heard, I've heard horrible things about the way they let go of Jesperson as well. Now, don't forget Bob. I mean, um, so how did it, tell us about your... Um, it was Jesperson who said, we won't need you anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when was this? This was December... Something, 24, 24 some, somewhere. We played a show at First Avenue was my last performance with them was December of 84. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had, I wasn't close to the band. Uh, I wasn't their friend from high school or whatever. And I wasn't as a, I wasn't a trusted mm-hmm. uh, confidant of Paul's or anybody's. I was pretty close to Chris. Um, Tommy was a young guy and he, he I'm sorry. That's right. Will the answer machine get that? Uh, it will, but it'll ring several times. I'll wait until yeah, it's done. Let it just, uh, get, sorry, five See. minutes of rolling. Take. So Five my relationship with them was not super close. Uh, I was pretty close to Chris, and uh, Tommy was a young guy and mm-hmm. an angry young guy. You know, he was angry with everybody. Um, I, you know, not that I was doing anything wrong, but you know, maybe I couldn't do anything right for him. Um, and Bob was not a scary character, but he was kind of unusual and I didn't necessarily connect with him. Um, I knew and respected Peter a lot because he was an adult when I was not, though we're not that far apart in age actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it, it really, I really wasn't, you know, connected to them emotionally. So I really was just a hired hand, which is perfectly acceptable um yeah i got i got the notice from peter that you know you're done we're gonna we've got this guy that we're gonna bring in and 
you know, he's going to take over now. And I'm just like, I was really kind of devastated. And it wasn't that I was losing this great paying gig. Finally, you know, during the last parts of this year, I kind of got an idea that this was something really big. But at the same time, I still was not really aware. It was like, you know, when, you, when you've got a job that's paying you great money, you think it's going to last forever. And things are never going to get worse. They're going to get better from here on out. And of course, that doesn't ever occur. What occurs is that, you know, there's a setback or the rug gets pulled out from underneath you. So there was a lot of frustration, mm -hmm. you know. And if I had known there, there, there was any frustration with my performance, I definitely would have tried to improve that. Honestly, I don't know why that why the change occurred. It could have been something from the band. It could have been something from a record label. Was, it, when, was this when they signed Desire? There was a, there was it was near that time frame. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly when the signing Desire occurred, but there was we had you know done that whole fall in New York and yeah. in the East Coast trying to make sure that we got in front of everybody. And there could have been. You know, it, it's it's the classic. It happened to me actually. Th that kind of story has happened to me repeatedly. I, you know, hey, I've got this relationship with the recording studio. Let's put a demo together, and see what we can do. I'll do it on spec, or I'll do it. You know, I'll do a reduced rate. The next deal we'll do, we'll do a better deal, and I'll get more out of you or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the next deal that comes along because of the work that was done on the first deal, the record company, the promoter, the agent, the whoever it is says, well, I've got this guy I want you to work with. You know, you mm -hmm. can't work with the guy you worked with last time. So that happens repeatedly in the industry. Yeah. You can't work for free now to get something later because ne later never comes. That's how it goes. Yeah. No hard feelings about any of that, though, because it is, you know, I, I was given a, an incredible gift unbeknownst to me at the time. And now I look back and go, wow, you know, that's really cool. I mean, my, my son is in school telling people that, you know, when he's wearing his replacement shirt, it's like, my dad worked with this band and every, all the other kids are wearing Led Zeppelin shirts. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, he, he understands. He understands. Did, were you surprised uh, a year later or so when you heard that Bob was tossed from the band? I was not at all because there was friction between Bob and Paul. There was always friction between Bob and Paul. I mean, was there, was there, was there, was there friction that went beyond, forget the drugs and the alcohol, was there friction that went beyond that? I mean, was there something else musically, perhaps, or the sound of the band or the direction of the band? I won't say sound of the band. It could be direction of the band. You know, once again, Bob was about doing his own performance. Bob was about, I'm going to wear what I want to wear. I'm going to not wear what I'm not going to wear. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And he hits his cues. If there were, you know, cues to be had, you're going to do the solo here. He's going to hit that stuff, but he's not ratcheting it, ratcheting it up. And that's just is because the band is aging. You know, the band is getting older, the boys are getting older, they're thinking more about long-term, they can see longer term into the future. And they can see that, you know, either we're on a path to destruction or we're on a path to glory or on a path to success or mm -hmm. freedom or whatever we're on a path for. And in order for me to, you know, completely speaking out of turn here, in order for me to further myself, I need to surround myself with people who want to go down that same path. And I can see that, I could see early on that, there wasn't a, a clash of the wills on direction or control of the band. It was more on, you just want to do your own thing. And we can't each do our own thing together. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that, that gets the answer you're looking for, but that's kind of what I saw early, right. early on. Was, was there, was there uh, much conflict in terms of, I mean, you hear a lot of, about the conflict where like Paul liked doing the ballads, the answering machines and so on like and the rest of the band usually would pick on him because of it, and because they, you know, Bob obviously wanted to be doing Ghosts of Thunder. <laughs> um, I think that there there was some friction there because of that. I mean, they're a rock and roll band, so let's play rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And you know, we don't want to be Journey and do these beautiful ballads. What the hell? That's, that's not what we're doing. Right. The, the yeah, of course, there's friction because of that. Um, there is a lot to be said for what actually occurred outside of the performance, meaning what was recorded. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if a recording occurred where, you know, it's Paul playing all the guitars and, you know, Answer Machine is a great example. You know, just mm -hmm. playing guitars and, and singing the song, what's the band doing? Right. It isn't us, it's you. 
And of course that, you know, when they're young and the egos are fragile, that really becomes a big problem. Mm -hmm. And it can accelerate really quickly. You hurt my feelings. I'm not going to say you hurt my feelings. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to be obnoxious on stage. Mm -hmm. Were they underrated musicians? I'm sorry. Were they underrated? Un underrated? Yes. This, you know, if it was Tommy a better bass player than probably people thought, or it's in down the line. Uh, I think that they were underrated musicians only because people didn't see them perform as well as they could. If they were, you know, if they were just going to sit down and actually play and not be hammered, mm -hmm. yeah, they're incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, Chris has a lot of energy, and you know, it's it's like anything. It, if you try, it's going to be better than if you don't try. Right, right, right. If you hit the drums versus letting the drums be hit, <laughs> I mean, that's really what it comes down to. If you're going to sing, open your mouth. If you're going to strum the guitar, make sure that people can hear that you're strumming the guitar. And and that's where, you know, once they're, once substance got into the mix, then, of course, it was, we're, you know, we know we can do this without even thinking about it. Right. We're just having fun doing what we're doing. When he was trying. How good a guitar player was Bob Stinson? Um, I can't compare him to other guitar players. I'm not a guitar player myself, so I, okay. I don't know, if, you know his chops. I, I would say that his consistency was amazing. And that's, you know, that's a lot to be said for somebody because if you are very affluent in whatever your particular instrument might be or whatever your particular discipline might be, you explore the other pieces of that discipline in order to, to be self-satisfied. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to, you know, if you're writing a story, you're going to write from the first person, third person. If you're, you know, painting, you're going to use acrylics and you're going to use oils. If you're writing, uh, you know, writing a song, first you're going to try something in a rockabilly style and then you're going to try something in, you know, a 4-4 four -four style. Whatever it might be, you're going to change it up because you're bored with doing it the same way you've done it for the last five mm -hmm. years or 25 years, whatever it might be. The fact that he could hit the same kind of emotion nightly was really incredible. And the fact that he would do it intoxicated is also incredible. You know, it's, it's, and I wouldn't say that that, you know, substance equated artistic creative to creativity. Mm -hmm. Substance was just a piece of who he was. Right. And, you know that I think he could have done just as well and did just as well without substance, or without substance abuse, I should yeah. say, because he was ob there was obviously a lot of emotional substance there. The band from uh, okay, you're mixing the band. The band was known for being out of tune a lot, <laughs> or tuning. Let's let's talk. About, I mean, how tell us any interesting tuning stories or lack of tuning stories. <laughs> um. Well, I think the only reason the band was out of tune is because, it, you know, just like anything else, they beat the shit out of their equipment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we're, you know, I can't hear myself. My amp doesn't go any louder. I got to play harder, you know, which, of course, destroys a guitar's tuning. That's just what happens. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I don't have any incredible tuning stories. Uh, you might want to talk to Sullivan. He was on stage more than I was on stage, mm -hmm. so he m might be able to go, yeah, whatever. There's this story about tuning or whatever. Right, right, right. Um, but Paul also, you know, as as a writer, he definitely did his own tunings. He would, you know, change his tunings in his guitars in order to get certain types of sounds or to, you know, to play the chords in a different yeah, fashion. Said it, at one point, probably it was around that tour, he started o discovering the open tuning. Yes, and, he would do yeah. did a lot of open tunings. Yeah. yeah, which of course, for somebody who's a musician and uh, Back up. Paul, Paul is probably a musician's musician more than he's a performer mm -hmm. for the general audience. And, and I'm a big fan of Daniel Lenoir, and he's a musician's musician also. And I, you know, watching him play guitar is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's got a, a very strong gift of doing sustained, long melodies right. and, and big open sounds. I don't know where Paul picked that up, where he picked up open tuning and where he decided that he was going to change up how he was delivering. But his, when he did that, musicians in the audience are like, oh, wow, I want to see what's going on here. Of course, trying to see that through the chaos of fast performance mm -hmm. and see that through the chaos of substances and, and drugs and alcohol and all the craziness that's going on. 
So there was that artistic component in there or that self-creative component right. that was mixed on top of or mixed underneath chaos. Mm -hmm. So one of the people, uh, one of the uh, groups that we actually talked to was this girl band called the Bristols. I'm not familiar, I'm sorry. You're not familiar? Are they no. tour when, 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 at the time? Because I know they toured with the band a lot. Okay. Well, did, did they give you a time frame? I thought it was... Around Let It Be, but it might have been in uh, right pre Let It Be. Okay. Because uh, I know they did a bunch of tours in them, and uh, I just didn't know if you would had any. No. Idea. Okay. I didn't know if that was that was in your period. Um, were there any? Uh, yeah, were there? How did the replacements get along with the bands that either opened or they opened for? Um, that they opened for. Well, we when I was working with them, we did an extensive run with X, and we did uh, a few coincidental events with REM. Mm -hmm. And you know, once again, that's kind of a musicians musicians really relationship there. Right. And as I mentioned before, you know, watching them on stage, watching Xene and John Doe, and and watching them on stage together, and it's a small club with the stage is barely bigger than this table, is just that's what. I live for. I right. want to see that. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of respect that went each way there. You know, I think that uh, more successful bands, you know, if, if you're opening for somebody, you're probably opening for somebody who's more successful than you are. They looked upon the replacements as these guys are doing, they're, they're, they're doing what they want to do. They have no path. They're boundless. They're going wherever they want to go and they're doing what they want to do. Did we make a mistake by deciding we were going to try to do, do this straight up and, and actually deliver the same performance every night with mm -hmm. a fixed set list? Hmm. Not that they're not that these bands are second guessing themselves because they have their success in their own right, way. Right. Uh, there was respect from the headlining acts towards the band mm -hmm. because of that no holds barred rock and roll. Because I know both Xene and John Doe were big fans, and, and mm -hmm. there was a, an article uh, uh, where uh, they were. Uh, did, uh, was it Spin? It was uh, in Matter Magazine. It Matter, was, okay. it was uh, people of the year trying to uh, picking like who they was their favorite. So, and both of them now. picked replacements. Mm. Yeah, in, in Phoenix, and I, which I thought was really nice. We were trying to get a hold of them before we go out to LA. Okay. Um, and uh, okay, uh, REM. REM obviously had a connection with this band. I mean, because I mean, the first time I saw replacements, they were opening for REM at Toads. Okay. In New Haven, um, which was probably believe, '83. Bob was wearing a dress. Um, <laughs> And uh, the loudest, most obnoxious band I'd ever seen in my life. I had no idea what I was seeing. You had no idea what you're seeing, and you went there to see REM. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and we were literally up against. Do you remember? Do you remember Toads? I have. I. The most recent memory of Toads is that it was closed because I was there on a Monday, and they are not open Mondays. Um, because I was there in the uh, early early decade uh, mm -hmm. to for my for business. Um. I haven't been to Toads for since then yeah. for twenty something yeah. years. So, so the stage probably comes to about here. So we were literally up against pressed, the stage, pressed against the stage, pressed against the stage, and you know, there, there's, and uh, that was our, it was an early tour, so it was probably around right after Murmur came out. Okay. So, um, you know, and this this band comes out, and it's just I, I I I don't think I fully appreciated what I was seeing. It was just it was literally just so unbearably loud and unbearably. <laughs> It was just this, like, it was just, I mean, you're here to see R.E.M., which is such, like, jangly and pretty and, you know, Roger McGuinn kind of guitars. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and and it, it, was just, it was just, it was just noise and drunkenness, and, and I, yeah, it was like. Well, the, and I don't, uh, so that's the problem with, there's too many bands and not enough clubs or whatever. Mm -hmm. the, the, the problem is, is that there's just, there's not enough exposure for a lot of bands. Of course. In any case, you, you know, do, who do you, who do you pair up with R.E.M. or who do you pair up with yeah. replacements? Because they, as much as they're both popular college bands yeah. and they both got albums on the charts, that doesn't mean that they go well together. Right, right. And you know, I, you know when I was you know, very young and I went to see concerts, mm -hmm. it's like I just didn't even want to see the opening acts. Yeah. I didn't want to be exposed to that because I came to see this thing over here. Yeah. So but sometimes um, the opening act really surprises you. Oh, d totally, definitely. I mean, let's put it, it this way: I'm not doing a documentary on REM. I'm, you know, it's like here, right? I'm, you know, oh, right. Twenty-seven years later, that you know, there is there is that and. You know, from a consumer's point of view, I would say that it might be difficult for them to be an opening act because they aren't, they aren't glossy. Yeah, yeah. It's very gritty. It's very edged. It's 
sometimes even painful or embarrassing to watch mm -hmm. if you're expecting to see something and you see something completely different yeah, it's like yeah, what is this guy doing on stage in a dress yeah um so so then you know then move it down the road another year and in, in trenton and you've got you know the butthole surfers opening up and you know that looks completely chaotic compared to this professional band the replacements mm -hmm. you know it's yeah <laughs> i remember i saw uh my god it was uh, uncle tupelo open for someone at toads and it was for replacements. It was for, yeah, and 87, it would have been 87. 89. Was it, it was the 89? 80, 88 or 89. And so it was that last show at Ruben Toes, okay. And um, it, it, Uncle Tupelo came out, and they were basically, what the replacements were, when I saw R.A.M. open, this hardcore sounding band, no joke, one of the, the hardest punk bands I had ever seen. And then I go and buy the record. I was like, it's, it's pretty. Like, what the fuck is this? I literally, I bought the record thinking, I think I called you up, I said, is this the same band we saw? I mean, it's like, we were there, right? I wasn't there, I'd seen them. As, okay, as, as I, I think I'd like, Ash, that. and it was like, I'm like, who is, it It was like, it was like complete night and Well, night. okay, so let's. That was a perfect example of the complete opposite of like, what you, you record and you, Right, yeah. what are you expecting? Yeah, I mean, and that's yeah. kind of part of, you know, whether the, the energy was on the record or not, yeah. Um, well, let's just say that the energy was on the record for the replacements. They could definitely mimic that. Yeah. They could I, mimic it, or they had the same energy live because it was nearly almost recorded live. Yeah. Um, and I then mean, from the opposite perspective of when I see a band that's highly produced, and I'm I'm a huge pop fan. I love mm -hmm. highly produced music. When I see a produced band live, I'm expecting it to be kind of yeah. subdued or less than the performance. Yeah. This was one where I, I didn't really know about Uncle Tupelo much, and they, you know, and and they were such a rocking band and then I go the first album is so mellow it sounds you know it's so country and oh. it was just it was just like I, it just I, I and so I so I, the next, I I completely skipped over the next Uncle Tupelo albums because I this was not anything that I thought I'd be interested in and of course then when Wilco comes out I, I fall in love with Wilco but you know but um, I think it's it's a lot I mean that that first that first uh, the first time you see someone the first time you hear someone really does stick with you Mm -hmm. You know, and which I think is, it was always funny for me because like that first time I saw the replacements, I really just, they did not, were not my cup of tea. It well, was, and that, that goes back to my first show at Duffy's. It's like, yeah. I was more engaged with what I was doing and trying to pick out which is the guitar mm -hmm. that I need to be soloing and what was going yeah. on. I, you know, boom, it happened. Yeah. And I've got to figure out, okay, now I've got an idea of what these songs are like. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like I'd listen to the records for months and months and months prior and go in and go, oh, yeah, I know exactly right. what these solos are. Oh, he missed that solo. You know, I had no idea what was going yeah, on. Yeah. And that's, you know, does that mean I was exposed in a different fashion? Yes, it does. Does it mean it was a better exposure? I would, it's, no it's no way to know that. And I think that the the exposure for, I, I think the way people are exposed to music is very, a, very much a personal thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, it used to be that I, would listen to an album nonstop for from beginning to end, from beginning yeah. to end, or I would listen to it nonstop for it would be the CD in my car for the next three weeks of mm -hmm. commuting or whatever it might be. And now it's like it's almost I've kind of turned into that that sixteen and fifteen year old who listens to a song Trouble kind of, play kind of person. Yeah, yeah, just like yeah. 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 So well, it's also it's funny because I saw I remember having a conversation about mixtapes and how mixtapes are such a lost art form because of a mixtape with a CD you just hit so easy to skip but a mixtape it actually takes you you know you yeah, it's effort yeah never, it, there's work you find where the next song is and things like that so for a, for a mixtape you probably gave it a, that first listen you probably actually listen to every song as opposed to like oh yeah I don't really like this let's go you know and uh, which so yeah definitely a lost yeah. art form yeah yeah you know? yeah Pandora's a terrible thing yeah. <laughs> skip 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 the um Talk, let's talk about the music for a little bit. Okay, uh, uh, you as a fan of the replacements. I mean, after you left, uh, after you got fired, sure. Did you listen to? Did you keep listening to the band? Yes, 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 yes. Um, and I, this is the problem I have with every musician that I've run into is that I glom on to what is either nearly their most recent or their most recent component and go into the back catalog mm -hmm. and find the grit and then everything that comes out after that doesn't quite meet the need of the grit mm -hmm. i like the more raw i mean you know, the way the, the way the records are produced the way that the albums are recorded um are v 
very haphazard, you know, the, you know, double false endings or whatever. That kind of stuff is super attractive to me. And I can't get enough of that. Mm -hmm. And then when things are very prettified and glossy and, and trimmed and, and clean yeah. and hit, and they hit stuff, I just kind of go, yeah, that's a really pretty song, but where's the real emotion? Yeah. The, uh, so I so I, I can can I make the leap to say that you're not the biggest fan of uh, Don't Tell a Soul. I'm not the biggest fan of Don't Tell a Soul. Yeah, yeah, lost me, lost me. It please uh, made me. Uh, same here. So, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 you know, and it's not bad. It's just not raw. Yeah. And I think that from a, you know, we all grow up. We all have expanding tastes we all decide that you know i can't be an angry teenager for the rest of my life i'm going to probably be a little bit more serious but when it comes down to my consumption of or if i let's say i do have a, a hard day and i want to kind of do a little head banging what am i going to do yeah you know i'm not going to turn on lawrence welk right i got to go back to the catalog and go okay here's what i think of the top 25 hardest hitting songs I've got in my collection and I'm going to listen to those songs and I'm going to go yeah that you know it does two things for me it rocks you know in the Jack Black it rocks mm -hmm. and in the it has an emotional connection yeah. whether it's a love song or talking about running a red light mm -hmm. okay so which I've done <laughs> I'm going to do what of the albums what, which of their albums so, I mean if you're if if you were making your Desert Island list, which replacements album would you put? Would you put an all replacements album on? And which one would it be? What, if I took one with me, yeah. uh, I'd take Stink. Wow. Okay. Okay. I totally. If, if, if you were making your Desert Island list, which replacements album would you put? Would you put an all replacements album on? And which one would it be? What, if I took one with me, yeah. uh, I'd take Stink. Wow. Okay. Okay. I'd totally take Stink. Yeah. <laughs> Stink has such a fun. It's really weird. It's like why would I, you? Why does that make you? I, I think no. I think I, I'm. 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 <laughs> Are you second guessing yourself? No. No. no okay. No. Good. No. I. I. Um. Stink, it is so loved here in Minneapolis, and like, and and we're interviewing people in New York, and it's it's it seems like the different pockets have different favorite albums. It's really. Oh. Weird. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's it's. I mean. Yeah. Well. Okay. But I told you that, yeah. and my exposure to them was, you know, it's. It's Let It Be, mm -hmm. Stink, Sorry Ma, and then, you know, that's what I got. Yeah. And that, that has a pretty good, even distribution yeah. of ballads and, and rockers and short and fast and whatever it's got in it. It's also pretty evenly the same material yeah. all across the board. But if it was to pick, if it was to pick one of those three, just those three, it's got to be Stink because it's got beautiful emotion mm -hmm. and raw energy in it. What's your favorite replacement song? Go. Did you ever, did they ever play Hootenanny where you got to go up and play one of the instruments? Uh, no, I, no, I didn't. Um, but they did do that. Yeah. Periodically change of instruments. But I never, I'm not a, like we've talked to other people might be afraid to be on camera. I am totally not comfortable getting on stage. You're like the mixing board. I'm the guy the behind the stage. Yeah. yeah. I've done yeah. Smoke and Mirrors my entire life. And I really excel in that, and I enjoy doing that position. Mm -hmm. I like helping an artist fulfill their potential. That's what I like to do. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be on stage. And coincidentally, after I got off the tour with the replacements, I started working at the Guthrie Theater as a smoke and mirrors technician there, a stage technician. And dur during the very first show, I was doing there, not the first performance of that show, but the very first show, several weeks into the performance, um, one of the par cans on stage burst and rained glass down upon the stage. And this is during the performance. And I was directed to go on stage with the dustpan and, and room and sweep up the glass so that at least they wouldn't slip and fall and cut themselves on it. And I did that. No, I have no problem going on the stage when there's 100,000 people in the audience at all. Until somebody engages me in the focus, I can tell the focus is upon me. And of mm -hmm. course, you know, during the performance, this the gentleman, the lead actor, addresses me as a porter. He's like, "Thank you, porter, for cleaning that up." And I'm just like, I'm frozen. And I have to literally not think about the audience, not think about the focus that's on me, and actually get up and get off the stage. 
terrifying. Mm-hmm. Terrifying. And I can completely sympathize with musicians who have stage fright. It's like they are all about expressing their emotions, creating art, creating connections with audience as long as they don't have to see the audience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's right. like, yeah, it's like... My least favorite thing about book writing is doing book tours and having to read to people. To read Even to people. read my own words, I am shaking. It, it, I absolutely, I so, I, I like being behind the camera. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I don't mind being in front of the camera, but it's the, it's a live audience that gets yeah, me. You know what, it's that reading to, I mean, I don't mind when we do film festivals and I go up and talk afterwards, because it's really just, they're asking me questions about the movie. It's technical. But actually reading to me is, is absolutely terrifying. Hmm. Wow. Well, I think everyone's got their own, you know. Yeah. 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 Did, were, you at, were you writing something down? Oh, okay. The, and that, okay, so, you mentioned potential. Did did the replacements, in your opinion, live up to their potential? Are you asking me from this perspective or from a different perspective? And I might say this perspective is like you know now we're looking back mm-hmm. and yeah, I say looking back. I mean, okay. I mean, do you think this was a band that should have been bigger or bigger? more commercially successful? Yeah, I mean, the next Rolling Stones. No, American no, Rolling no, no, Stones absolutely, or? absolutely not, because it would be a completely different band. Mm-hmm. You know. The, the people who are raving fans of the replacements, let's just use them because we're talking about them. The people who are raving fans of the replacements really, really either have, they have an emotional connection to the music or the performance. Mm-hmm. And this has been a talk about performance primarily. Um, we're talking about the music also, but really we're talking about what did they do when they were on stage? How did the audience react to them? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, if, if anybody had a negative reaction about them, you know, they were drowned out by the people who were like, oh my God, I saw the most amazing thing last night. Mm-hmm. And you couldn't, you couldn't gain widespread commercial success, in my opinion, it's not possible for a band to do it without actually kind of fulfilling an expectation of the customer. And the customers, for sake of argument, 50% or more of the customers expect it to be, you're going to play this song exactly like it sounds on the record. Okay, so did they meet their potential? I believe they did 100%. Did they miss something? No, they didn't miss anything. Because what they did was they did what they wanted to do. Whether they knew what they were doing or knew what they wanted to do, mm-hmm. unknown. Right. Did they have a direction? Completely unknown. I'm guessing no. They didn't really, um, you know, when they started out, it's like, you know, we don't think we're going to be the next Rolling Stones. I don't think they thought that. Maybe Paul thought that he would be the ne- the next. Who knows? Mm-hmm. But I think that was about Paul being the next artist, not him being in the next rock and roll band that the world's going to recognize. Right, right, right. Do you feel in the twenty years since they've broken up? Do you do you hear their influence a lot in other bands? I'm talking more musically, not yeah. the performance, not the trying to mimic their stage antics. I don't think as much as, not in this, not in this, not in the current decade, which was mm-hmm. just about to end here. Um, I think that the influence was incredibly heavily, incredibly heavy ten plus years ago, and has of course tapered off um, because of, well, maybe this is a mistake in my own observation because I'm so old now, but. I really enjoy getting a body of work from an artist, not a single piece of work from an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, if I hear a song that's attached to a video soundtrack or a movie soundtrack and I go, oh, that sounds really interesting. I'm going to go get the rest of that, get that album and it isn't available because they only did that one song for that. I need to have more exposure to the artist. So, and I think that what happens is now artists are influenced by more maybe artists are influenced by single performance or this particular piece of artwork mm-hmm. or art music whatever it might be instead of the body of work mm-hmm. you know it's easy now just to get that one song off to iTunes instead of downloading an album or right. getting an album from a record store and if you got the whole album you may go yeah the hit's great but this one other thing is incredible right i mean answering machine is a great 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 song but is it really possible to be a commercial successful hit maybe but maybe no, not his voice probably i mean i love his voice but i mean i don't his voice is so uncommercial i think well, yes yeah. yes uh, i mean there's 
and but but the question that you you're asking me is did it influence other bands and i think that you know that song or other you know go or johnny's gonna die or whatever these other mm -hmm. ballads are that are really powerful probably inf influence bands dramatically and they may not have ever gotten that exposure if it had been today yeah yeah they never i would never would have been influenced by that band if i had to go buy the whole album because i'm just going to download the one hit song and i don't know i wish i had the demographics to tell you that if somebody downloads this hit song that means they download these five other songs by that same cut. that's an interesting that would be an interesting point to look up yeah because okay. that really tells us and there's two things that the internet can give us that it's not giving us today and it's difficult to do one of them is exactly that the owners of that information, Apple or whoever the music company is, isn't going to really tell you that, you know, this is what's really being yeah. bought. The second thing that I would like, and this is not avail really available, but could be available, is, okay, you asked me, who do I, do I think that Ray Placements influenced a bunch of other bands? And I think the answer is yes, and I think it's more the, la the first 10 years since they broke up versus the most recent 10 years. What I would love to know is, okay, if this band... If the replacement influenced this band, who did this band influence. also get influenced by and right. influence? Right. And vice versa, replacements. Right, right. Replacements are influenced by, by, by. Right, right. So that web of who influenced who would be really nice to know. Yeah, yeah. Because you're an author. You've written lots of books. Who were, you in, who were your influences and who did you influence? Because if you write this and you were influenced by Raymond Chandler, yeah. I'm going to go read Raymond Chandler. Right. If you were influenced by Agatha Christie, I might go read Agatha Christie because yeah. that, you know, there's so much material out there. How do I find what I'm looking for? Right, right. And I, I that's and way off topic for this particular. No, but it's, it's it's how I find bands nowadays. I mean, when I find a band that I like, it's usually from following the links at the bottom of. Uh, I love e music. Uh, you know, because I, I actually refuse to to ever like get music for free online I will always pay for it it's because we're old <laughs> it, and, and, and I've, but I've also seen my movies ripped online of course and it's like it's it pisses you off it's like you know I'm, a, I'm you know it's like and it's like you know and it's just, I I own an internet yeah. access and hosting company right we I mean we have very high speed access in my office mm -hmm. and you know it's frustrating for me who I've never written a song in my life. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating me to see all my employees going to sites and downloading free music. I'm like, you guys, you can't do that. It's yeah. not something that you do. And the only reason it's something you not do is because it's like somebody going to your house and reading your journal and not paying you for it. It's, I, it's, my wife has three brothers who are state cops. And one of them constantly, his him and his wife are always getting free CDs of people who are uh, downloading really way before they come out on DVD, free DVDs. And I literally said to him, it's like, okay, but so, like, if I came and smoked pot in your house, would that bug you? And he'd be like, yeah, I would, I, I, I would never let you do that. But it's like, but you're doing something illegal here. And no concept of, like, you're stealing. Wow. This conversation is getting way it's off way, yeah, the topic. And like, I would, we could love, I'd love yeah. to have this conversation. <laughs> I agree, I yeah. agree 100% that the, the, the transaction, the nexus of the transaction of when you take a piece of data and it was created by somebody yeah. and you're taking it for free, that should be very, very simple to do and there should be a monetary transaction yeah. that happens at the same time. Apple did a really great job yeah, okay. at yeah. making it available that anybody could sell their music online and it's, it's low cost. Part of the problem now, though, is what I just mentioned before yeah. is that you're not getting the full exposure of the artist. Yeah. Well, if they're doing an, ep an epic opus of the meeting, the courting, the loving, mm -hmm. the hating, the breaking, the leaving, and you're just, having one and you're just seeing the loving. Right, right. Well, I mean, you know, but I was saying that what I love about, one of the things I do love about this and finding music is where you go to these sites and it's like, okay, this band was influenced by this people, they influenced these people, and they sound like these people. And I always just start clicking links and going, you know, it's sort of to, to, to build that sort of like, you know, uh, uh, connection between bands. And that's, that's how I usually find most of the new music I listen to. You know, starting with like, well, if you like the replacements, try out this new band, you know, or mm -hmm. whomever. And that, I think, is a great way. I think that's one of the things I think the web does give us. Right. It gets us a large exposure. I mean, that's sort of like walking into a record store and it's like and having the great old guy standing there who's not, these stores don't exist anymore. 
you know, but saying, hey, it's like, you know, they know what your taste is because you're in there every week. And hey, this new album's came out. Listen to this. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that as much as, and I don't know how much is this on topic or not, but I think as much as the various online retailers are good at kind of collecting, well, since you bought this, you might like this, right. you know, the Amazon thing. I think that's really great, but I think it'll never be as good as know, my person. friend Amy, who works at Roadrunner, and she says, I heard about this thing coming out, you should get it. Yeah. Because there are literally too many releases. Well, if, if, you're, if your wife read saying a story, there's a character in there, which everyone tells me how much they love, called The Professor. And he runs a music store, and he turns the daughter of God onto all this music. The professor's a completely real person. In fact, he's one of my, my face friends. He ran a he ran a he ran a record store in Waterbury. I mean, my God, the rec it was something like eight thousand square feet of just crates. Albums packed so tight, you'd be like, <laughs> like oh, this. he's pulling it apart. Oh to see my it. God! And it was just, and he was, he was that. Peter he, Jesperson of Waterbury. Yeah, he was the Peter Jesperson of Waterbury, Connecticut. Right. Probably, oh boy, I mean, really, oh, he, that was the best record store in, in his time in Connecticut. But that character is a hundred percent real. That is him to a T in that book. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, and th that knowledge, I mean, that's why people have editors. That's why people yeah. are. That's why content really should be edited, is because they have this knowledge of a larger context and go, oh, you know, you really ought to just try this thing out. Mm -hmm. It's not what we're being told by the publisher is the best thing to come out. We're actually giving you our honest opinion, yeah. third person, third person's perspective. I don't, you know, I'm not going to make anything by telling you this. Try this. Yeah, yeah. we need that. We need that dramatically. Um, back to the replacements. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, a question. Um, stage fright. Yeah. Did they? Did they have so, stage fright? Yeah. I don't think so. No. Well, or I mean, that did that ever? Was that ever a reason for any of the drinking, or it, it was just them? Just it never, it never even occurred. Well, it would um, no, I totally not aware okay. of them having any kind of stage fright. I never saw it. Mm -hmm. Never was a, a, an issue for me that I was aware of if it existed. Um, you know, to answer the question on drinking, it you know, th this is there's only so many records that you can buy at a record store. There's only so many parks you can visit. There's only so much TV you can watch. There's only so much radio you can listen to. You've heard this album how many times? I'm bored. Mm -hmm. And we're in a town where we don't know anybody. Mm -hmm. gotcha. My friend Jack. I'm going to go talk mm -hmm. to my friend Jack. You know, I'm not saying that that's right or wrong. Right, right. I'm just saying that the ability to self-entertain today is so much higher than it would have been or was at that time. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, maybe the thing to do is sit down and, 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 you know, write a song a day or take a picture a day or write mm -hmm. a journal entry a day or whatever it might be, you know, to, to be creative. I'm with you there. But a lot of times it's miserable outside and, you know, you've only got a couple hours to, before mm -hmm. you got to kill some time somehow. W was Westerberg ever the kind of, I mean, I feel silly because I, I think I know the answer to this one, but was he ever the kind of sensitive artist type that was sitting in the back of a van trying to write a song while the... You guys are into a show, and I, you're laughing. It's like I... <laughs> no, he was much more sensitive than that. Okay. Um, and I, you know, the to answer the question more obliquely, I think artists in general, you know, sometimes don't realize they're artists until later, mm -hmm. and they kind of throw things together because they're just emulating. It's like, you know, the kids all want to be baseball and football and basketball stars today because that's what they see. It doesn't mean that they're really good at it. Mm -hmm. And we can tell you that, you know, you've got one in three million chance of becoming a baseball superstar and being a pitcher is even worse odds than that, whatever the odds might right. be. It's really easy to watch a TV and go, oh my God, that guy's strumming that guitar and having a great time and looking the girls falling over him. I'm going to do that. And it's easy to pick up a guitar and hammer out three chords and put together a song that comes from the heart. But does that mean you're an artist and you can actually, you know, to have discipline to do it every day? Mm -hmm. you, as an artist yourself, you know that actually writing is difficult work. Writing a song is difficult work. Mm -hmm. So how do you do difficult work in a chaotic environment? I have no idea. Gotcha. 
So no, the answer is <laughs> <laughs> Paul was never sitting in the back of a bus running. No, the next answering machine. No, no. <laughs> I mean, no, no, no. And I should say, under discipline, absolutely not. Possibly he was mm -hmm. doing stuff in his head, um, you know, journaling definitely, but not sitting down working stuff out. Uh, a silly question just occurred to me because every girl I know, including my wife, is in love with Tommy Stinson. Uh, were any of I don't know. Um, but it's the same question every guy asks. I, Why? I, I have so many kissing Tommy Stinson stories. It's 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 not you know I could I could call this kissing Tommy Stinson. It was just that could be the entire film. It won't be, but it could be. Um, That'd be great. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that's that's, that's going to be an extra on the on the DVD. A full feature yeah, Easter egg. Kissing, we need an Easter egg. Kissing Tommy Tommy Stinson. Did you see the Easter egg on the website? I didn't look, didn't look that deep. Oh, click the volume control. Oh, I did. I heard the interview. Oh, you, okay, yeah, I love interview that. With, I love that. With Minahan. Yes, yes, I love that. Yeah. Um, I love the story, but the story takes place after they broke up. So I was like, I'm probably not going to use this in a movie. So let me just put this here. No, yeah. it's it's good. Yeah, yeah. that was a, those are great. That's a great story. Yeah, it's absolutely um, great. Did uh, any of the other guys in the band ever like like what the fuck is it they see in you, or was he not the chick magnet at that point? No, he was a total chick magnet. Okay. He was a total chick magnet. And it, wh why not? I mean, yeah. super skinny, lanky, big hair. You know, who knows what's slung below that guitar? We can't yeah. see. It. You know, he's got pretty eyes, makeup. I mean, just just a pretty boy. Was, was, like, was his brother or ever, like, like ever just annoyed by it or just like bust his ass about it? Or? Um, the relationship between Tom and Bob... Uh, Tommy was a ladies' man, mm -hmm. and Bob was interested in his self exploration, mm -hmm. and, and and you know that means, you know, if I'm gonna take drugs or I'm gonna mm -hmm. drink or what I'm gonna do, whatever, what I'm gonna do, I'm. He wasn't interested in that kind of pursuit. Was there now? And and Paul was not. You know, Paul was focused on mm -hmm. different things, not on picking up ladies okay. at all. Um, Chris, I don't know if there was a desire there or not. I'm not real sure. You know, I mean, I, it, it's not like, you know, I... Basically, my job was get gear in, get gear out, get us to the next place, more of a professional level. Was, was there ever... Pro I, I've heard stories of, like, you, you go to leave at the end of the gig and Tommy's always the one that's missing. Yeah. <laughs> Anything, any funny stories of, like, where's Tommy? Well, the first thing that we would do is we would ask around to say, has anybody seen Tommy? And then the next thing we would do is like, did anybody get an address where to pick up Tommy? You know, talk to, talk to Peter, talk to Sully, talk mm -hmm. to whomever, talk to the guys to say, has anybody heard? Did he go somewhere? And a lot of times when we were in familiar places like Chicago or Madison, we would just like, you know, he'll call us tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So that's normal. And that's, you know, once again, now that I've done more of this stuff, that would never be allowed mm -hmm. in a professional setting. But this was not that. It was this was seat of the pants, have fun, we're gonna enjoy it. When you finally got to a professional, being on the road with a professional rock band, okay, was it shell shock to you? Um, no, it wasn't shell shock because. I had been exposed early on to a more professional level, and this mm -hmm. was a change from that. This was you know, not opera. This is rock and roll. Um, then I went did theater, and then I did more independent rock and roll. And going back into independent rock and roll was a shell shock for me, actually. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. That's what going back to other bands and like see, well, it's it's we are actually doing sound checks. So. Yeah, and so yeah, the answer is yes. I mean, going and it's like you know. Knowing that somebody's going to take care of something and it's going to be the same thing as it was last night and make sure you write down the right name of the city on the monitor so that when they say, thanks, Toledo, <laughs> we're actually in Toledo. Uh, Did that ever happen? Um, <laughs> you gotta, I, I, that you've got to ask about the math. No. Did they ever get the city wrong? <laughs> no, no, because that, that wasn't part of their, their... There wasn't a spiel. Okay. That wasn't part of the... You know, the banter was Paul just kind of, what do you want to hear? Mm -hmm. More of an interaction and question and answer period. 
and then play a song and then break it and maybe finish it, maybe not finish it. If you finish it, what do you want to hear? Or they're going to play something else because yeah. they that sparked an idea for them to play they something else. They weren't doing Springsteen type monologues. No, no yeah. monologues. No, no. I mean, I and I saw Paul uh, do a performance at First Avenue a few years ago uh, where he talked about his songwriting and, and he still doesn't have the story teller mm-hmm. thing the in him yeah. yeah no I mean he talked a little bit about his influences mm-hmm. and it was interesting to hear you know Michael Jackson was huge and, and yeah. it's just like you know I, I'm kind of surprised by some of these things and that was kind of interesting to see but he still didn't have that you know performer mm-hmm. performer thing down Did, what was the next band you worked on uh, the next rock band you worked on after that um, let's see Next major tour would have been. Uh, so I, I went to work at the Guthrie Theater for several years, and after leaving the Guthrie Theater, then I worked for a local sound company, and I did lots of one-offs. I did Bruce Springsteen, and I did Judy Collins, mm-hmm. and I did the Nylons. So that I mean, doing a those Bruce Springsteen were, show is probably completely night right. And day. It's completely night and day. And I also worked for the local stagehands union, so I did you know Bowling Stones and mm-hmm. David Bowie and all these big show, big arena type events, and it's like, you know. Each person has their job, and they do them exactly in sequence, and the building blocks go together, and all of a sudden, four hours later, there's this ginormous thing that's built. Completely different feeling and no emotion at all Mm because it's about the money. That is all about who's going to be in these seats and make sure that the sight lines are correct and they're going to be able to hear it because they're paying X dollars per seat. Um, That, yeah, I I would just recently, I went and saw uh, Carol King and James Taylor, and, Mm -hmm. you know, a beautiful performance, but you know very well that since they didn't use a set list and they play exactly the same songs every night, they just are doing the. They're just going through the motions. Yeah. Yeah. I mentioned to a friend earlier about you know he said that he saw some band and you know he'll remember that that show forever. And I said you can I can guarantee you the performer will not remember that show because it's identical to every other show in every other arena. Mm-hmm. You know either the seats are multicolored or they're all the same color. That's all it is, unless something goes wrong. And if something goes wrong, the more something goes wrong, the more they're going to remember it. So if you ever do happen to run into it, pray that the sound system goes out or something falls from the ceiling or something major happens because that will be the show they remember. And you can say, yeah, I was in the 48th row and I saw that trust mm-hmm. fall from the thing, blah, 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 blah. And they'll remember and you can have an actual connection with the artist. Um, so I, I kind of lost your question there, but my... My big my big tour after the replacements was the Jets. They're lo- another local band, mm-hmm. pop, super pop band, and they we did a pretty extensive tour of the south part of the country. Um, did a, it, it's kind of an interesting thing. You can follow the state fairs across the country, play all the state fairs, and then mm-hmm. kind of follow the carnivals back across the country, and there's kind of a circuit that gets played. Okay. Um, and, and yeah, I did, so I did the Jets. I toured. Uh, I did Rod Stewart for a little while, and you know, I really didn't dislike being on the road. But I'd been doing enough performance, and doing performance repeatedly uh, over years disconnects you with the rest of society to mm-hmm. some degree because you kind of lose track of where am I doing laundry tonight, and where am I taking a shower, and what city right. am I in. Um, after a while, I really preferred to be off the road, and I really wanted to do more recording. So I got out of that and started doing more recording. Gotcha. And and eighty eight was the last touring year I did. You mentioned uh, Michael Jackson. Let's bring up the other huge person from Minneapolis, Prince. Okay. Was there ever? Did there, I mean? The two completely separate worlds. The, I yes, but uh, was there uh, was. I, I'm assuming the replacements knew who Prince was. Obviously, did they? Was there? Were there any? Were they fans at all? Or um, that's an interesting question. Would they, I, would they go see Prince at First Avenue? I, I, Paul probably would, mm-hmm. but I don't know that anybody else would. I mean, because you know, Kiss was the influence, right? It was. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it was just not, not there. I mean, and. At that particular time, well, Prince went to Minneapolis Central High School. Paul went to Minneapolis Central High School. His his sister Mary and I went to Minneapolis Central High School. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're all in this small little community, but really there is 
there is a there's two separate worlds there. There's yeah. white boy blues rock bands, and then there's funk bands. Mm-hmm. And you know, having the, having flight time play the prom, you know that that prom is not designed to have a white boy blues band rock band play. Yeah, just not going to happen. So there was there was probably a desire later in his career to see, but you know, did I go see Prince when I was at, at you know at first Ave when I had the chance? No. Kill right. myself now. Really wish I would have. Yeah. yeah. So you know, eighty four, he filled in Purple Rain, and man, that was like, that's when we were doing. But the replacements played First Avenue when some of the setup for Purple Rain supposedly was there. Correct. I believe that is correct. That and, and I remember I, someone someone wrote to us and said, that, yeah, Westerberg. You remember Westerberg commenting from the stage how cool it was to have all of the Some stuff in there. Yeah. Um, the. I think that when we mentioned this earlier is that I think that there was a respect. There's mm-hmm. a there's there's always respect. I mean, there was whatever animosity there was between Husker Du and replacements or Law of Past Rules, Soul Simon replacements, whatever those things were. There's still a level of respect between bands, and that would go you know genre to genre. There's no reason that actually I think there probably been more respect outside of genre, because mm-hmm. knowing how hard it is to play jazz or knowing right. how hard it is to play blues. And you know, have been doing it for fifty years. You know that the, you know not that anybody's going to get down on their knees and bow down to Johnny Hooker, but you know that's a guy who amazing career, amazing career. So or Hank Williams Senior, mm-hmm. whatever it might be. Was the um, rivalry between uh, Mr. Du and replacements real? I think it was between the fans for for the fans. It wasn't between the bands. That I could see or fathom, mm-hmm. because there's no reason for it. the The rumor is so much more powerful than the truth. And the less you say, the more the rumor just gets going. Right. Okay. Um, is there anything else you would want to add about this band that I didn't somehow cover here? I, yeah, the only thing I would say is that I have to thank them for teaching me about the darker side of, of life. <laughs> okay. 